Señor Comandante en Jefe del Ejército, General de Ejército, Don Humberto Vigo Herrera, Señor Director del Army War College, Mayor General William E. Rapp, Señor Comandante de Educación y Doctrina, General de División Leonardo Martínez Remontó, Señores Oficiales Generales de Países Amigos y de nuestro Ejército de Chile, Señores Oficiales Superiores, Señores Agregados de Defensa y Militares de las Embajadas de Países Amigos, Señores Oficiales Jefes, Señores Ex Alumnos del Army World College, Profesores de la Academia de Guerra, Alumnos de la Academia de Guerra y Academia Politécnica Militar, Invitados Especiales, Señoras y Señores. Hoy, dentro de las actividades académicas de la Academia de Guerra, en mi calidad de Jefe de Extensión, tengo el alto honor de presentar a ustedes al Mayor General William E. Rapp, con su clase inaugural Desafíos Estratégicos para el Siglo XXI, La Guerra en un Mundo Complejo. El Mayor General William E. Rapp es el 50 Comandante del US Army War College. Se graduó en la Academia Militar de Estados Unidos en el año 1984, siendo comisionado al Cuerpo de Ingenieros con el grado de subteniente. En cuanto a su formación como oficial, su educación militar considera el curso básico para oficiales de ingeniero, el curso avanzado para oficiales de infantería, el curso de Estado Mayor en el Army War College y el curso conjunto en la Academia Conjunta de los Estados Unidos. En el plano académico, su formación considera el grado de bachiller en ciencias otorgado por la Academia Militar y una maestría en artes y ciencias políticas. Asimismo, una maestría en políticas de seguridad y un doctorado en ciencias políticas de la Universidad de Stanford. De su vasta carrera militar, se puede destacar el trabajo inicial como comandante de pelotón, oficial ejecutivo, oficial de operaciones y oficial de operaciones de un cuerpo, tanto en Alemania como en el Fuerte Bragg en Carolina del Norte. Fue comandante de la Compañía de Ingenieros Aerotransportada durante las operaciones de tormenta del desierto, la 54 a Batallón de Ingenieros de Combate Mecanizado en Bamberg, Alemania, y comandante del 555 Grupo de Ingenieros de Combate desplegado en apoyo a la 101 División Aerotransportada en la Operación Libertad para el Irak, y comandante general de la División Noreste del Cuerpo de Ingenieros. Además, el mayor general Rapp sirvió como 62 a comandante del Cuerpo de Cadetes en la Academia Militar de Estados Unidos en el año 2009 y como comandante del Elemento de Soporte Nacional y segundo comandante general para el apoyo a las tropas norteamericanas desplegadas en Afganistán en el año 2011 y 2012. Su última destinación, antes de asumir como director del Army World College, fue como jefe de enlace legislativo en el Ejército de los Estados Unidos de Norteamérica. Señoras y señores, tengo el agrado de dejar con ustedes al mayor general William E. Rapp y su clase inaugural dentro del ámbito de los desafíos del estratégico para el siglo XXI, la guerra en un mundo complejo. General Avio Oviedo, comandante en jefe de la Ejército de Chile. Señores generales, instructores y alumnos de la Academia de Guerra. Muy buenos días. Es, es un honor y placer estar aquí, aquí hoy en su presencia. Y con eso he llegado al límite de, de mi español. Y ahora a hablar en inglés. Thirty years ago today, I was uh, in Saudi Arabia. I had just left uh, Iraq with my I, I'm sorry, 30 years ago today, I was in uh, Germany. I was a first lieutenant guarding Western Germany, Northern Bavaria, from a group of Soviet forces stationed in Czechoslovakia. War for me was very clear. We knew what our enemy looked like. We knew what vehicles he drove. We knew what uniforms in war. War was complicated, but was not very complex. 
War for us was about timetables, about ammunition resupply, about movements, about long-range engagements. It was a math problem, not a very complex problem. 25 years ago today, my company, an airborne engineer company, came out of Iraq. We were back in Saudi Arabia. We had just fought a 100-hour battle against an enemy that wore a uniform we knew, fought in vehicles that we recognized, uh, and one that we had a clear timetable and plan for action. That was executed extremely well, and I would tell you that war might have been complicated, but it was not complex. Complicated is about dealing with things that we know and that are hard, but can be figured out. I would tell you today that the wars that we will face in the future will be complex. They might not be knowable and they will change as soon as we start taking action. What I would like to do is start with some myths. Next slide, please. Myths that many in the world today think war is true. So we'll start with the first one, next. This is the myth that future wars will be short, Future wars will be relatively easy, like Desert Storm 25 years ago in 1991. But I would tell you wars are not over until all sides agree that the war is over. The war of Chilean Revolution did not end with the tragedy uh, at Rancagua. Cagua in 1814. That did not end the war. The war ended when O'Higgins came back over in 1817. Wars will go on until all sides agree that they are over. Next slide. Wars of the future will not be like the movies where they are solved by very, very highly skilled special operators in the dark of night coming down and taking out very discreet targets. So although Hollywood in movies like O Dark Thirty or Navy Seals might portray war of the future to be dominated only by special operators, I would tell you that war is not about sweeping in and hitting one single target. And although these operators, Army Rangers below, Navy SEALs above, are very, very skilled, they are not sufficient in war. The next myth, next slide, is that wars of the future can be won from distance using precision weapons, either launched from the air, launched from ships, launched from land, and that war actually is just a targeting exercise. That war is about figuring out what the high value targets may be and hitting them with kinetic weapons. I would tell you we found this not to be true in any number of instances. And yet there is a great lure to this myth. Next slide, please. I would tell you that an army cannot be built overnight. The United States has a tradition of raising very large armies very quickly when we need them and then getting rid of the large armies afterwards. This is mobilization for the Second World War. In 1942 and 1943, 
the United States Army raised 83 infantry and armored divisions. Each division, 15,000 soldiers. You cannot do that today and expect not to have very, very high casualties and a tremendous amount of damage on the battlefield. Wars are blunt. Military power causes casualties, civilian as well. It is not clean. And the wars today require professionals, like those in the Chilean army, like those in uh, the US Army and other partner nations that train to be ready for real war, not the wars of mythology. <coughs> Next slide, please. Karl von Clausewitz, the Prussian theorist, said that the nature of war is constant. There are continuities in the nature of war. And yet the character of war can change. If you would allow me to talk about some of those continuities. Next slide. This is a meeting of tribal and community elders in eastern Afghanistan. The continuity here is that all war is political. All war is fought for political reasons, and political is about the distribution of power, the distribution of resources after a conflict. Wars are not just about people fighting, but about what they are fighting over. These tribal elders are in this politics, trying to decide what to do. Until that struggle is resolved, the, the violence of war will continue. One of the reasons why Iraq went from relative peace in 2011 to uh, very dangerous and not peaceful today is the underlying politics between Sunnis and Shia and Kurds was never resolved. So the military might make violence go down, but unless the underlying politics are addressed, the war is not over. Next, the continuity that war is human, that it is a human endeavor, and that it is fought where the humans are. That war is not just about combatants, but also about civilians, wherever they may be, and about their future. Next slide. It is hard to see, but this is a picture of the Pacific taken from NASA at night. If you can barely make out, the points of light show you where the people are. The light uh, on the far left is Japan and China. The upper right is United States, Canada, and Mexico. Down the lower right is the western shore of South America with Chile there. Wars will be fought where the people are. There might be engagements in the air. There might be engagements on the sea. But because war is political and it is about humans, it will eventually be where the people are located. Next slide. The next continuity of war is it is about will. It is a contest for will. These are two Roman wrestlers, and they would continue to wrestle until one gave up. One was defeated and knew that he was defeated. Again, the war does not end because we wish the war to end. The war ends when the contest of wills is over. 
Next slide, please. The final continuity to always remember is that war is uncertain. War has a fog to it. As Clausewitz would say, it has a friction to it. It is never as clear as a map exercise. You move a unit on a map, and the unit actually goes where you want it to go. In reality, the lieutenant leading that first column gets lost, might run into a minefield that no one saw, might encounter uh, something that was unexpected. And one of the challenges that the United States Army faces is a belief among many in the United States that technology has made war knowable, that we can know all things, that if we have the right sensors in the air, if we have the right sensors on our vehicles, we will know and we will reduce the fog and friction of battle uh, to something that makes it very much like a map exercise. I will tell you that with I had all of that technology at my fingertips in Iraq and Afghanistan, and war was still very confusing, still very uncertain, still full of fog and friction, just like Clausewitz said it would be. So next slide. So what are the changes that we can expect in the future? What are those things that cause the character of war to change? Remember Clausewitz said the nature of war is constant, the character of war changes. What are those changes? Next, weapons will change. And because the weapons will change, the character of war will change. The introduction of the machine gun caused tactics to have to change in the First World War. The introduction of the U-boat, the submarine, caused naval tactics to have to change. The introduction of the airplane and later the unmanned vehicles has caused the character of war to change. But the nature of war, political, human, uncertain, contest of wills, has not changed. There will always be changes in weapons. And we must anticipate what those changes may be and take advantage of them without losing sight of the continuities of war. Next slide, please. The environment in which we will fight will change. It may be a mega city like Dakar or a large urban slum uh, in parts of Rio de Janeiro. It may also be the incredible desert and scarce vegeta vegetation of southern Afghanistan or other places. So the environment of war will change. And we cannot build a force that is only good in one environment and not good in different environments. Next slide, please. The formations, the tactics, the organizations of armies will all change. In its day, the Macedonian phalanx in the upper left was the most powerful organization known to man in warfighting. The Macedonian phalanx uh, had no peer for many, many years. But the Macedonian phalanx went away. The infantry square, this is the British at Waterloo, a organization, a tactic to deal with cavalry if you are an infantryman. Again, a change. Uh, in the organization and tactics of war, but not in the continuities of war. At the Pentagon, we are working every day. What are those future uh, organizations? What are those future tactics? What is the impact of those weapons? So that uh, we may not be able to know exactly what 
the next war will look like, but we will be less wrong than our opponent, who also does not know what the next war will look like. Next slide. Finally, something that you can absolutely expect is adaptation and learning in a war. Your enemy will not want to fight you fairly. Your enemy will always look for advantage. They will always attempt to learn, whether that is camouflage, use of terrain, or, as we found in Iraq and Afghanistan, the improvised explosive device. Something we had not considered, something that we should have considered going against an enemy that could not fight us toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe or vehicle-to-vehicle. -vehicle. We should not be surprised by this. Change will always happen in the character of war. So allow me to look to the future. Next slide. I offer just four future trends. The trend is the 100 years ago. My iPhone has many, many times the computing power of my computer when I was a young lieutenant. That empowers people. Look at Egypt and the ability of people to rally almost spontaneously. Look at Osama bin Laden and his ability to act. We can count on people to be empowered in the future much more than they were in the past. Next. And what this brings is a diffusion of power. Fifty years ago, we would have said that power was retained by states, by countries. That military power was resident uh, and controlled by national armies, governed by national governments. We are finding that those same capabilities are employed by non-state actors. 9-11, 18 individuals, 18 individuals on four airplanes killed more Americans than were killed at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. You have ISIS, Boko Haram, they're not states but they, they have power uh, that has been taken away from traditional states. We should expect this in the future, that our adversaries may not all uh, own territory with recognized governments, but operate in between territories and across them. Next. We can count on our adversaries seeking asymmetrical advantage. There is no adversary, uh, and I will use Chile, in, in uh, South America that would take on the Chilean army. You are too good in a fair fight. So they won't do it. They will look for asymmetric advantage, just like our adversaries look for asymmetric advantage with us. And they do this in four ways. They avoid our strengths. They put their rocket systems in the middle of densely populated cities. They know that we will not bomb uh, large urban areas because of uh, our desire not to have civilian deaths. They will try to disrupt our work. We have become very dependent on global positioning satellites, GPS to tell us where we are. I would expect the next war will begin with an attack on the satellite systems that give us GPS to disrupt our capabilities. There are drones being flown by ISIS. They emulate our capabilities. And they expand beyond what is traditional. They expand into social media. They expand into civilian groups. They expand to use organizations for their advantage that may traditionally be non-military. 
But what we can expect in the future is our adversaries not to want to fight us fairly. The historian Conrad Crane, uh, who works at the U.S. Army War College, writes that enemies of the United States will fight us in one of two ways, asymmetrically or stupidly. Those who attempt to go symmetrically uh, will likely die. Those that go asymmetrically are looking to exploit advantage that they have, and we can expect that to continue. Next slide. The final trend in the future that I would uh, offer to you is that war will often look in the future uh, to what we call hybrid war. It will not look traditional. This is the Russians in Ukraine. It started with little green men, no identification patches, nothing to say that they are Russian Spetsnaz troopers. Uh, they go in, they use proxies. It had a very heavy cyber component. Attack through cyber means to disrupt the Ukrainian army's abilities to defend. It, uh, uh, it goes to conventional forces and artillery. The Ukrainian army has been under artillery barrages that are so accurate and so timely as to decimate battalions in a matter of minutes. An army has not faced that kind of bombardment since the Second World War. So it's very conventional. So it's hybrid war is all of these things together. And we can expect that to be the nature in the future. So what do we do about this? Next slide, please. I offer these. The importance of partnerships. The importance of, of our armies continuing to build these partnerships and trust. I offer the development of leaders. Because it will not be a magic weapon that wins the next war but rather the leaders that are produced in this uh, academy uh, and in others around the, the world. It is about education. I think about training as here is how to do a known task. We train lieutenants to breach minefields. We train sergeants to do maintenance on vehicles. But education is about thinking about complex problems. It's not about how to do something, but how to think about difficult problems. And I would tell you that education in the future that I describe is incredibly important. And finally, it is about building your strategic thinking skills. So the first slide, next, is about partnerships. General Oviedo will recognize himself and General Trombinas, uh, his classmate at the U.S. Army War College. General Oviedo, graduate in 2000, built partnerships and friendships that have lasted through his career. <coughs> we have many of graduates of U.S. Army War College here, and uh, it is good to see uh, all of them. The uh, partnerships, these two are Chilean and Army Special Forces training together and building trust. In the future, wars will not be usually one nation versus another nation. They will tend to be coalitions. They will almost always be multinational, which means the partnerships become incredibly important. Next slide. The next it is about developing leaders. It is about helping our leaders, all the way from lieutenants to generals, develop and think about uh, their craft, their military expertise, their ability to think. I applaud the Chilean Army for looking at uh, non-commissioned officer education and how important that is because our sergeants do a lot of the fighting at the lowest level. Are they able to think 
when a problem does not look like what they had trained on? How do they resolve that? It's about focusing on leaders. Next slide. This is education. This is U.S. Army War College in this room. While many of you are just starting your three-year journey uh, at the uh, uh, Académie de Guerre, uh, this is important. Your education, though, does not just happen when you are in a school. It happens for your entire career. John Maynard Keynes, the very famous economic uh, theorist, once challenged an audience very much like this. He said, I change my opinion when the information changes. What do you do? You would be surprised how many people, once they have decided on a course of action, will not vary off that course of action, even if the information changes, even if the assumptions that were the underpinnings of that plan have changed. Even if the facts are now very different, they won't change. And I would tell you, what allows change is your constant, lifelong education. <coughs> Eric Hoffner writes that in times of change, the, learner, the learners, those who continue to learn, will inherit the earth, while the learned, those who have decided that they have learned all they need to learn, will become beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. So I charge you, what is on your nightstand? What are you reading every day? How are you working on your education? Because the hard problems of the future will not all be solved by uh, the chief of your army. They will require your assistance. And one day you will be chief of the army and you will have these problems. Continue your learning. Last, next slide. So in order to think strategically, I offer the following for your consideration. One of the most important is moral courage. When I asked for this slide to be translated the first time, the word came back, valor, which my Spanish is limited, but I took to mean bravery. Bravery is easy. In battle, you will all be brave. The physical courage is easy. It is the moral courage that is much more difficult and much more important for strategic leaders to make difficult decisions, to challenge uh, assumptions that everybody else knows to be true. Your character, your integrity, the trust that you can bring. Vitally important to be a strategic leader. If your character is suspect, it does not matter how smart you are or how brave you are or how good of a soldier you are. Colonel Joachim Piper commanded Kampfgruppe Piper in the Battle of the Bulge. He was the foremost German panzer tactical leader, and he was chosen to lead the armored spearhead through the Battle of the Bulge. At the small town of Malmedy, he captured an American field artillery unit, almost intact. Joachim Piper was a brilliant military leader but his character uh, was horrible. He ordered his men to line the Americans up and they machine gunned them in a field near Malmody. Joachim Piper uh, <clears throat> might have been a good tactical leader, but it was that kind of leadership uh, that can lead a country to ruin. Do not neglect your character. Your expertise is very important. <laughs> You cannot expect to be a tremendous military leader unless you understand your craft, unless you study your uh, areas of expertise. Otherwise, you could be like an uh, American Confederate General Pickett, 
George Pickett uh, was last in his class at West Point. He led the famous Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. Uh, he was very brave, uh, but uh, no one would hold him up as, say, this was an expert in military affairs. Your humility, your humility is being humble and understanding that you do not know everything. Those who lack humility uh, shut their mind to new ideas that may be very important to them. Your humility is important. Never lose it. Because humility allows you to have curiosity. Curiosity is to ask why and to explore new areas. Uh, to not be content that the book solution is the right solution. I understand that there are no pink slips of here is the solution to this tactical problem at this academy, which is good because there's never a pink slip for the solution for any problem except for an engineering problem possibly. Tactical problems, operational problems have various degrees of goodness and badness in all of them. Your curiosity helps. Mental agility is the ability to bounce between ideas. If you were to look at uh, General Oviedo's daily calendar and look at he deals with personnel issues and then the next minute is dealing with operational issues and the next minute is dealing with training issues. It is about in your mind being agile enough to move around and understand many different things. If you are not there already, soon you will be past that point of career where you can worry about one thing. Now you have many balls that you must keep in the air, and that requires your agility. Empathy is about seeing from your opponent's point of view. You must do this to understand who you're fighting who your potential adversaries may be, and why they do what they do. Comfort in the gray means that gone are the days where there is a perfectly good solution and a perfectly bad solution. There is a white and a black. I will tell you the very, very hard problems are hard because they're in the middle, they're in the gray, that there are advantages to this one, but there are some disadvantages. There's advantages to this one, but there are some disadvantages. Um, and you have to be comfortable working those. I would say never lose your character, because some issues are black and white. But the hard operational and strategic issues are often gray. And finally, balance. This is about you as a person. You will do your army no good if you have a heart attack at age 51. You will do your army no good if you try to stay awake for five days straight and then you fall asleep for the next 24 hours when very difficult questions are being looked at. So I would tell you balance. It is about sleep. It is about exercise. It's about proper nutrition. It is about your spiritual balance. It is about your emotional balance. It's about family, and it's about work. I urge you to have balance uh, in your life. Because at the end of the day, to deal with the future that I talked about requires there to be these partnerships, and those partnerships help develop leaders. Those leaders uh, allow us to uh, to be strategic thinkers, and I would tell you never, never stop learning. Next slide. With that, I would love to take your questions. Because it's about this. This is a private in Charlie Company 1508 Infantry that dropped, uh, airborne drop uh, into Kirkuk in March 2003. He jumped a rucksack that weighed 125 pounds. 
He had to carry that, no vehicles, through the next three weeks or so until uh, they were linked up in Kirkuk. All the decisions that we make, all of the preparations that we do for leading soldiers in battle, at the end of the day, are carried by privates and corporals and sergeants and second lieutenants. So this is important for all of us. And I congratulate all the new students. I congratulate the faculty for uh, leading such a tremendous program uh, here uh, at Akagwa. Next slide. Thank you. A continuación se hará espacio para una ronda de preguntas por parte de los asistentes. Señor. Quisiera consultar. Nobody's talking to me yet. I can, I can. Gracias. Quería consultar cómo se entrena el pensamiento estratégico en el Army World College. Sí, me gustaría consultar cómo se entrena el pensamiento estratégico en el Army World College. It's a, it's a good question. Your question was how do you train people to be strategic thinkers at the Army War College. I will tell you, you cannot train people to do that. You must educate strategic thinking. Again, you train people to do tasks that are known. You educate people to think about problems that they must solve. So just like um, uh, Akagwe does, the U.S. Army War College requires our students to read very widely and read uh, texts that they are not predisposed to agree with and then talk about that in seminars to be presented with challenges that they had not thought about and discuss them in seminars. <coughs> Almost all of the instruction at the U.S. Army War College is done in small seminars. About uh, 16 or 17 students each of those seminars has Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, civilian, and four international students. So when they are faced with these problems, <laughs> they, they get a wide range of possible solutions and ways of thinking about that. And it causes people to, to think strategically uh, and not just fall back on the training that got them there uh, in the first place. Gracias. Sir, I would like to know about what is your opinion about the comprehensive approach and do you think that is the right way to face uh, a complex war? Um, the comprehensive approach, can you describe it for me? Yes, it's the way uh, to face a war with several participants, like diplomatics, uh, uh, NGOs, uh, government agencies, all the all the members that are part in this war now, or in a in a complex war. It's a very good question. The uh, as military, we often fall back on what we know, which is. Because we're a really big hammer, all the problems look like nails. Um, but I would tell you that most of the problems are not nails. They are political, at which point the military is part of a solution, but not the whole solution. Uh, we use, um, in English, the dime, diplomatic, information, military, economic, as elements of power that all must be brought to help resolve a problem. 
because the problem has underlying political ramifications. I will use the story from Baghdad 2007. I'm there as part of the surge of U.S. forces. So we have about 130,000 troops uh, in, in Iraq. Uh, May of 2007, the highest level of violence and attacks. By August 2007, very low. By November 2007, very, very low. By March 2008, very low. And many thought the war is over. But I will tell you, the war was not about people shooting at each other. The war was about how the Sunnis could have a voice in government, how the Kurds could have a voice in government, how the revenue from oil fields in Basra would be shared with all of the communities. Um, that's what the war was about. And so the reason that violence had gotten lower was because the US Army and our partners, mostly the British, um, had convinced the Sunnis not to shoot at us and convinced the Jam, the Jaysh al-Mahdi, uh, the, the Shia supported by Muqtel al-Sadr, not to shoot at us. But just because they are not shooting at us does not mean that the war is over. What was really necessary was the diplomatic and the informational and the economic. The military itself was not sufficient. So uh, every problem will not be a nail. And it is very comfortable to think they're all nails because we have a big hammer. And I would urge you to continue the comprehensive approach and think about that. I know where you live, Robbie. Yes, sir. <laughs> Sarah Major Cruz, School of Other Nations participant here in Chile. I saw your interview with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, the students of that of that uh, of that school, and they continue to seek a silver bullet. Uh, in terms of the technology that we use to be successful in the logistics aspect. Uh, here at the Academy, we recently had a week-long leadership workshop. One of the aspects that I presented was commander's intent. Can you talk about the human element of meeting commander's intent along with the technology that allows us to be successful? So, the one thing that about future war is most certain is that it will not be successful if it's directed by one person uh, and there's no initiative uh, allowed down below that person. We were not overly worried about the Soviets uh, in 1985. We knew uh, always shoot the tank with multiple antenna. Always. You take out the platoon leader, you look for the next one with multiple antenna, that is the company commander. Then all other 11 tanks, they don't know what to do, they will stop, uh, they won't keep coming. Uh, because initiative had not been given down to subordinates. What do you talk about in terms of commander's intent is a, is a U.S. concept that I think is very valid. It is how does um, a commander all the way at the top of the army express what he desires to happen and empower his subordinate generals to exercise initiative within that intent. There are problems with that. Sometimes things go wrong. That's where moral courage comes in. If you have granted permission for a subordinate to use uh, their initiative to follow your intent, then you must have the moral courage to back them up if something bad happens. Because even if they are trying their very best, the fog and friction of war means sometimes bad things happen. 
But I do not believe a future war will be successful ever unless leaders throughout the level are given uh, the, in, the opportunity to exercise discipline initiative within a commander's intent. And that's why I think it is so important the NCO education uh, must continue so that even NCOs know that they can exercise um, initiative within a commander's intent. It's a good question. Thank you. During your speech, you spoke about four different points uh, to increase our skills and to face in a better way this new kind of uh, war or this new kind of um, threat. One of those points was the, develop, the leadership development. From your experience and from your point of view, what is the better way to increase this specific topic? I would tell you that leader development is what I consider my most important job. I would say for a lieutenant colonel, leader development, most important job. For a captain, leader development, most important job. Because all of them are worried about how they are developing subordinates below them uh, to be good leaders. Part of that is encouraging them to continue their education, continuing to uh, exercise initiative. But leader development is not at one school, one time, uh, and then you're done for the career. It is every day. It is about each one of us mentoring subordinates. And it doesn't have to be formal, where you bring them in and you read them a, a statement about how they're doing. It can be a grab them after an exercise and walk over here and say, how'd it go? What could we do better? What things are you thinking about? Based on what you saw, what will you try doing now? That is leader development. And it happens every day in every army, or at least every army that wants to be successful in the future. So it is very important. It does not just happen at a school. Excuse me, sir. Please. Sir, General, here. General Rapp, here. Oh. My apologies. <laughs> it's like a disembodied voice. General Gonzalez, I'm the Chief of the International Affairs Officer. Thank you very much for your presentation. Excellent. Voy a preguntar en español. Nosotros sabemos que en el War College hay una gran comunidad internacional de alumnos que participan en él. A su vez también se realizan trabajos de seminario con temas apuntados a discusiones en temas recurrentes, actuales. Mi pregunta está orientada a, durante su mando en el War College, ¿cuál cree usted que han sido o han sido los principales aportes que ha realizado la comunidad de alumnos internacionales que participan en su instituto y cómo esta, cómo esta comunidad ha ido evolucionando en el ámbito de la cooperación con su, con su World College en los últimos años. Gracias, Miguel. Thank you, General, for that question. It's very important. Um, when uh, General Oviedo was a student at the War College, uh, I believe there were 40 international students in his class. Uh, today we have 79, representing 73 different countries around the world. Uh, every seminar has four uh, international officers uh, in their seminar to, to help. Last year's class, uh, uh, the number one graduate was our Canadian officer of the whole school, Colonel Ted Middleton. Uh, the number one paper was written by our Pakistani officer uh, as his master's thesis um, and I would tell you that uh, they are 
our international students are invaluable to the learning uh, because they offer perspectives that many Americans uh, do not know. Uh, most of, of my colleagues know Iraq and Afghanistan very well. Um, many of them have spent time in Germany or Korea. Uh, but we are very ignorant of uh, the Americas. We are very ignorant of Africa. We are very ignorant of South Asia, um, other than Afghanistan and the problems in the Fatah in Afghanistan. Um, this discussion uh, is incredibly important. Uh, but we ask every one of our international officers to write a master's thesis, a strategy research paper. Um, many of those papers, like our Pakistani officer, uh, become uh, very well distributed uh, because they're very thoughtful and they look at problems from a different perspective. And that different perspective is, is very, very valuable, not only to the American Army, but to their classmates uh, as well. Uh, I am absolutely uh, thrilled that we are going to have 80 international officers this summer, the highest ever at the U.S. Army War College. Um, it only makes us stronger as a war college. Just. Thanks, Jim. Para uso de la palabra, el director de la Academia de Guerra del Ejército Coronel, Cristian Bolívar Romero. Juan Tén, jefe del Ejército, distinguidas autoridades, invitados especiales, profesores y alumnos, General Rapp, good morning and thank you all for being here this morning. It's been 20 years since the Chilean Army sent the first student to the United States Army War College. That was in 1996. And this is the first time we received the visit of the U.S. Army War College Commandant as part of the agreement signed two years ago between the Army War College and the Academia de Guerra. So thank you very much for coming to visit us today and also for the great keynote address you have just delivered. We all know you have a very busy agenda and from the very beginning you accepted this invitation which, is, which I believe is very important to increase our partnership and I'm quite sure we will continue to work in that direction in the future. I have to say to the audience that we asked General Rapp to talk about either strategy or leadership or education. Well, he took this challenge very seriously and put them all three topics together in a superb way. Q&A time was a clear indication of the level of interest of um, your presentation and how the students were stimul stimulated. Uh, your words of wisdom and experience on these critical issues are paramount to understand the complex world we are facing today, and I'm sure they will provoke further discussion amongst our students. I would say we have had a world-class lecture this morning. General, sir, on behalf of the students, faculty, and special guests, please allow me to thank you again for your speech and please accept this present as a token of our appreciation. Thank you very much.